All right, let's talk about the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, first, we have to define some things. So if we have two ideals A and B, we say they're co-prime if when you take A plus B, you get the identity, or you get the ideal generated by one, which is just the entire ring. And we also say that our elements, two elements of a ring are equivalent mod A if their difference is contained in A. So another way you can see that, or think of this, if you put the R2 on the other side of this equation, that says that R1 is in R2 plus A. So that means that R1 is in the, um, the, the R2 coset of this ideal, of this ideal if, you, if you quotient out the ring. Um, let's see here, so co-prime, yeah, all right, so now we have the Chinese remainder theorem, and this was, I believe this was written down by a guy named Sun Zhao or Sun Zhu, something along those lines. His name means Master Sun, and he has the same name as the guy who wrote The Art of War, but it was a different person. Fun fact. Um, and this... The, this this theorem is very old, and rings are very new. Actually, I think I think rings are like like 1900s even. So they're like mathematically they're very new. So obviously when this was first um, stated, it was probably just in terms of integers because integers are sort of like the standard um, example of a ring. Um, but anyways. So if you take, if you let R be a commutative ring, and I think we're at the point now where pretty much all of our rings are going to be commutative from here on out. So if I don't specify whether or not a ring is commutative, just say it's commutative. All right, so we take um, a ring which is commutative, and suppose it has a finite collection of ideals which are pairwise co-prime. So A1 through AN are such that if you take any two AI and AJ, which are distinct, then AI plus AJ is the whole ring R. Now fix elements X1 through XN in R. Then there exists a unique element X in R, which is equivalent to XJ mod J, X, which is equivalent to XJ mod alpha or mod AJ for every single J between one and N. So for every single index. Um, and so this is sort of an interesting proof because it sort of it's it sort of looks like induction, um, but it's not. In induction, you have like the base case, and then you have the inductive step. Here we have we do n equals two, and then we we prove it when n equals two, and then we prove it when n is greater than two. Um, so it's sort of got an induction flavor to it, but it's not induction, which is nice because induction. Um, I don't know when I when I first like started getting into the, into math like I really liked inductive arguments um, because it was straightforward, but now I'm sort of at a point where inductive arguments tend to be really tedious because you have to deal with oh consider the n case and then n plus one and then you've got all of these like you have to be careful that you're not doing like an off by one error or something like that. Um, but anyways, so it's proof. So when n equals two. We have two ideals a1 and a2 whose sum is r. So in particular, one is an element of r. So then there must be an ai and ai. So there is an element a1 in fancy a1 and a2 in fancy a2 such that a1 plus a2 is 1. All right, and so now we're going to choose y set y1 equal to a2 and y2 equal to a1. Then for i equals 1 or 2, yi is going to be equivalent to 1 mod ai. And that's because, okay, so let's look at it. A, um, so this says y1 is equivalent to 1 mod ai. Um, but that means that y1 minus 1 must be contained in, a, in ai. So y1 minus 1, well, y1 is a2. And so a2 minus 1 if we subtract this over here, then a2 minus 1 is going to be minus a1. Um, and certainly, since um, a1, since fancy a1 is an ideal, it's closed under multiplication, 
So um, the fact that A1 is in fancy A1 implies that negative A1 is in fancy A1. And so, um, but negative A1 is equal to um, uh, what I said before. It, it's equal to, um, it's equal to uh, Y1 minus one. And so, and so that's exactly what you need. And by the same argument, um, y2 is equivalent to 1 mod 2, or congruent, whatever. Um, then here, I'll, I'll say congruent. Here, so yi is congruent to 0 mod aj for i not equal to j. But here, the only scenario, the only possibilities are 1 and 2. So y1 is, is congruent to 0 mod a2, and why is that? Um, that means that y1 is in a2, but, but y1 is a2, so clearly that's going to be in a2, so certainly this is going to hold, because um, we, we, we chose it so that this works. Well, obviously, in this proof, we chose every, everything so that it works, but here it's really straightforward. All right, so now we're ready to choose our element x. x is going to be x1, y1, plus x2, y2. And the way I sort of think about this is that, like, um, this, I think of this as sort of a delta, as x1 being multiplied by a delta function, where y1 um, is going to be congruent to 1 mod a1, and y1 is congruent to 0 mod a2. So y1 is congruent to 1 mod, so um, yi is congruent to 1 mod aj, if and only if i equals j, otherwise it's going to be zero. So that's why I sort of think of the y1 and y2 as delta functions, because it tests whether or not um, the congruence matches with this index. Um, but anyways, you can see that if you consider um, x, uh, if you consider um, x uh, qu quotiented by a1, or, yeah, when we quotient by a1, then what happens to x? Um, because we're quotienting by a1, um, this, so a, y2 is congruent to 0 mod a1, so this part's going to drop out and become 0 when we quotient by a1, and all we'll be left with is this. And the y1 is congruent to 1, so all we're going to get is the x1. And so this will be congruent to x1 mod a1. And by the same argument, x is congruent to x2 mod a2. And that's exactly what we want to happen. And so that does it. All right, so now let's do n greater than 2. Then if we choose any index which is greater than or equal to 2, um, then a1 plus aj, so any j greater than or equal to 2, a1 plus aj is going to equal all of r. So then there exists some... Um, we can write 1, the element 1 in R, as A1, and we'll put a superscript J there in parentheses. We put the parentheses to specify that we're not raising it to a power. This is just like for indexing purposes. And then we, we add AJ, and here A1 to the J comes from A1, and AJ comes from AJ. And we do this for every single J, and so if we multiply these all together for from j equals 2 to n, if we if we consider this product, then this is just multiplying 1 by itself n minus 1 times, and so that's just going to be 1. So 1 is this product, but where does this live? Addition is commutative, so we can move all the elements of a1 together and all the, th all the rest of them separately. Um, and we can think of this as being the product of a2 through aj. All right, so 1 is in this, um, the sum of these ideals. But what does that mean? We know that this product of ideals is a product. We know that finite products of ideals are ideals. We've talked about that. Um, and so we have two ideals here, and their sum, and, and, and their sum contains 1. And therefore, their sum contains the entire ring. So therefore, we know that we, we, can apply, we can apply the case of n equals 2. 
And so what does that tell us? That tells us that there is, um, we know that there is some element, we'll call it y1 in R, such that, let's see, we need y1 to be equivalent to 1 mod a, and y1 to be equivalent or congruent to 0 mod this product here. Um, so I guess we weren't using like everything. We, we were just um, finding, um, what did we do? Yeah, we, we basically found this element y1 here. Um, and then we just stopped once we found that. All right, so we have this. Okay, so what does this mean? Y1 is congruent to zero mod this product. That means Y1 minus zero, or just Y1, must be contained in here. So Y1 is in this product. But remember, another thing we talked about is that this product is contained in the intersection. So product of A2 through AN is contained in the intersection of A2 through AN. Um, but what does it mean to say that Y1 is contained in this intersection? Um, so for every single j greater than or equal to 2, y1 is in aj, which means that y1 is congruent to 0 mod aj. And so this holds for every single j greater than or equal to 2. And that's pretty much exactly what we wanted this, y, wanted this y1 up here to satisfy. We wanted it to be like a delta function. We wanted it to be 1 uh, mod a, um, ai and 0 mod aj for j not equal to i. Okay, so anyway, so this gives us something, and it, so it's congruent to 1 mod ai, and congruent to 0 mod a everything else. So what we do is we repeat this, but instead of doing it for y1, we do it for y2, and then for y3, and y4, blah, 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 blah. So I didn't write this, like, like I could have, instead of writing this out for... Um, so here when I wrote like a1 plus a, aj equals r, I could have replaced this one with an i and wrote ai plus aj, then replaced this one with an i and then replaced this one with an i and so on and or replaced this one with an i and this this one with an i and so on and so forth. Um, but some of these formulas like this product here, they, 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 they're sort of messy to write out so I didn't want to do that. Um, once, once you see this argument um, when the index is 1, it's clear to see how to do it for every single other index. Um, basically, you, you replace the, instead of considering j greater than or equal to 2, you consider j not equal to whatever particular index you're considering. Um, but anyways, what we do is if we re repeat it, we get y2 through yn such that for each yi, yi is equivalent to 1 mod ai, and yi is equivalent to 0 mod aj for all j not equal to i. And so we have these sort of delta functions. Um, so anyways, now we take x to be um, the sum of xi yi for i equals 1 to n, which is just like what we did in the case for two ideals. Then, by the way we've constructed this, x is going to be congruent to xi mod ai for every single i. And that is exactly what we wanted to have happen. And this is the general case, and so we're done. The only thing I'm not so sure about here is uniqueness. Um, this isn't something we mentioned in class, which makes me... I, I sort of I sort of have like a gut feeling that uniqueness is something that should be like really obvious. Um, so just looking at it, it seems like it should be... Um, it might be one of those arguments where it's like, okay, well here it's, obviously you wanted y1 to equal a2 and y2 to equal a1 because you sort of do like a what else could it be type argument. But I, I'm, I'm still not 100% sure on the, de on the details on how to make it like, like what all the details are. But like this is a really common theorem and so if you want to see details on uniqueness, I'm sure you could Google it. I mean, I'm sure I could Google it, I just didn't feel like it. Um... So yeah, so that's a Chinese remainder theorem. Then we have this corollary, which is that if you take R and you quotient by this intersection of these ideals, which again are must all be co-prime, um, and this is going to be isomorphic to the direct product of the quotient by A1 through the quotient by An. And to prove that, we 
to find a map from here to here, which sends the element x to take x plus a1 all the way through x plus a n. So this is so this is actually a map from R into this product, not from the quotient into this thing. So anyways, we have this map here, and we know that for every single element, um, since these are all, all co-prime, if, if these are all, um, let's see here, do we, do we map it to this? Yeah, this is how we do it. And so basically it's surjective by the um, Chinese remainder theorem because whenever you, um, specifying x plus a1 through x plus a n is basically the same thing as specifying elements of, um, we're basically specifying elements of these quotients and so we're basically fixed, we're choosing x1 through xn here. Um, and so certainly we'll be able to find an x which will map to all of these. Um, because yeah, if you, if you take x, x is going to be congruent to x plus ai mod ai. Um, so yeah, and yeah, so we can always do that. So this is surjective by the Cauchy uh, Chinese remainder theorem. Cauchy, where did that come from? Uh, I miss analysis. Anyways, so we know the kernel of this map is, well, the kernel of each coordinate is the ideal AI. And so the, um, the kernel of this map must be the intersection, the, the kernel of this map must be the set of things which map to zero in every single coordinate. So it has to be the intersection of the kernels of all of these things here. Um, and so it must be, and, and the kernel of each coordinate is, go, is going to be AI, and so we have the intersection of the AIs here. Um, so the kernel is this intersection, and then use the isotheorems the isomorphism theorems. Because what we have is we have a surjective map and we know that this is the kernel and so if you take a map and quotient by the kernel that's going to be isomorphic to the image. And the image is everything because it's surjective and the kernel we just proved is this. And therefore this is isomorphic to this. And yeah. There we go. We've proven the Chinese remainder theorem.